Good morning and welcome to Church Without Religion. I'm Andrew Farley. Today, we're going to be talking about what it's like to be tempted. And given that you're a new creation in Christ, how does that make any difference in the moment of temptation? So with that, why don't we open with a word of prayer together. Father, we thank you for this morning. We just ask that you would minister to us today in a powerful way, that we would see Jesus, that we would see our relationship with him, that we would see your counsel in the midst of temptation, that you would show us this way out that you speak of uh, when we're being tempted. And we give you this time in Jesus' name. Amen. This message is tempted. What is it like to be tempted? And what is our response in the midst of temptation? You know, so many times we are tempted in familiar ways. We have patterns in which we've been tempted in the past and will be tempted again. These often traveled roads that feel so familiar to us and we are so used to them that perhaps uh, we're not so certain what type of response will actually work. Maybe, maybe you've tried your hardest to resist what feels like your own desires. So you're saying no to yourself. It's very much like saying no to your favorite treat, or at least it feels that way. And so temptation can be overwhelming. It can be very emotional. It can drag you down and ultimately make you feel defeated, debilitated, depressed, even bewildered about your relationship with God. I can't tell you the number of people that have contacted me through email or through Facebook or elsewhere, and they're saying, you know, my life was going so well, and then, and then I got beat up with this temptation, and I'm stuck, and I don't know what to do. Maybe I need to tell someone. Maybe I need to tell my wife. Maybe I need to tell my husband. Maybe I need to, or... Maybe there's no solution at all. Maybe I'm all washed up. Maybe this is it for me. Maybe I'm out of God's will. Maybe He can't use me anymore. I'm an elder. I'm a deacon. I'm a leader. I teach Sunday school. I serve in this way or that way. Maybe now, now I'm not qualified because I'm always being tempted and I don't know what to do. And so do you see how the enemy can use temptation and then accusation as that one-two punch in our lives to make us feel downtrodden, to make us feel unqualified in the body of Christ to do anything because we can't seem to break free from nagging temptation? Well, I'm excited to talk about this topic this morning because sure, over the years we have talked about the flesh and what the flesh is. We've talked about the power of sin and what sin is. But I wonder if you in your mind have a crystal clear idea of what it means to respond to temptation. What do you do? How do you do it? How does it work? And so that's what we're going to be talking about over the next 30 minutes together, we're going to be in specific addressing some very common temptations. Some of them, maybe you don't expect, would be topics for this morning. Certainly, we'll address sexual lust. Certainly, we'll address the love of money. But a few of these, you might not even have realized that you're being tempted with. So let's jump right in. I mean, first of all, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 gives us an incredible assurance about temptation. It says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted... He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Now, i got to tell you, that's reassuring. I mean, that's encouraging. That's comforting to know that there is a way out. But then you got to say, God, 
what is the way out? What does it look like? How do I respond? What do I think? What do I say? What do I do in the midst of being pulled toward sinful temptation? If there's a way out, what is it? And perhaps there's no better verse than in Romans to discuss that way out. Let's talk about it in light of sexual lust as our first category of temptation. Well, Romans chapter 6 says this, The death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now, this concept of counting yourself dead to a thought is going to permeate this message. In other words, you can count yourself dead to this kind of thought and count yourself dead to this kind of thought and count yourself dead even to that kind of thought that has been plaguing you for so long. But what does that mean to count yourself dead to it? You know, I like to think of it as this. It is beneath me. I am above it. I am better than that. Not because of something wonderful that I've done, but God has made you a new creation. You are better than sin. You are above it. Sin is beneath you. And when we recognize that concept, we see the temptation for what it is. The accuser came to Jesus and uh, accused him and threatened his identity and said, prove yourself and are you really who you say you are? And isn't the same, isn't it the same with us today? The enemy comes to us in a voice saying, Are you really who you say you are? Do you really believe that stuff? Because I'm telling you, this is going to pay off for you. This is where fulfillment is found. Sexual lust, sexual temptation, sex outside of marriage, the appeal of sexual attraction in an inappropriate context, that is where it's at for you. This is going to pay off. This is going to bring fulfillment. On the other side of this, you are going to feel so good. And you know where it takes you, right? Five minutes, 50 minutes later, unsatisfied, unfulfilled. Something went wrong with the plan. Oh, sure, there may be 60 seconds of some sort of satisfaction physically, but at the core of your being, something cries out within you for a deeper existence, for a better understanding of what makes you tick, what makes you work. Who are you? Why can't you do this like the guy next door who always seems to be just fine with it, even brags about it. There's something different about you. Now, in Romans chapter 6, there is a peculiar phrase. It says that Jesus died to sin. Now, come on. I knew that Jesus died for my sins, but Jesus died to sin? What does that even mean? What's that about? Well, it's very important because you think about Jesus, he, he, he never committed a sin. Why would he need to die to sin? Sin never had power over him. Why did he need to die to sin? And we find our answer in Romans 6. Jesus needed to die to sin because he carried you through that death to sin with him. Let me say that again. Jesus died to sin so that you would die to sin. Jesus died to sin, and then, get this, it says something very peculiar. It says something very important. It says Jesus died to sin once for all. Now, again, I've heard this phrase, once for all. You can find it peppered in the book of Hebrews, and it's typically used about our forgiveness, And if you don't know what once for all forgiveness is yet, I encourage you 
check out Hebrews 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, one of the most powerful passages in all of the Bible, in all of the New Testament. Hebrews 6 to 10 is incredible. It says you're forgiven once for all. You're not forgiven again and again. You're not forgiven over and over. You're not forgiven day after day or little by little or sin by sin. You are forgiven once for all time. Now, you say, all right, that's awesome. What does that have to do with Romans 6? Do you realize that your death to sin was also once for all? You know what that means? It means that you're not dying to sin. It means that you're not going to die more to sin. It means that it's not about memory verses and and every week making sure that you're in church so that you can eventually die to sin. It's not about your quiet time and your memorization and your church attendance and your good works. And it's not even about time passing. Oh, I'll be dead to sin when I get older. I can't wait to be 85 like those mature Christians over there because they are so dead to sin And I am not yet. And we're waiting. Oh sure, there's growth and there's maturity and there's learning. And that's awesome. We love to grow in our understanding around here. We love to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But did you know that you are not growing in your death to sin? The death that you died to sin... You died once for all. That's why it says, He died once for all. And then it says, In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin. Whoa. So, let's make this practical. A lustful thought, a sexual image, an idea comes to the forefront of your mind. What do you do? Do you say, well... I mean, this is just who I am. I'm so used to this. Oh yeah, here it is again. The same old image, the same old thought, the same old idea. The same old relationship that I keep returning to that is unhealthy. Is that what you do? It's same old, same old. It's just who I am. If you're saying it's just who I am. If you're saying I can't help it. If you're saying, well, I'm forgiven, so who cares? then you've missed the other half of the gospel. The other half of the gospel is right here, right now, in this moment. You are not made for that. It is beneath you. You are above it. You can count yourself dead to it. A hundred percent dead to that thought. Oh no, my heart is wicked. No, it's not. Oh no, a deceitful heart. No, no, no. You've got a new heart. You see how... It's interesting, people will throw stones at the message of God's grace and they'll say, this causes people to sin more. But when you really understand that by God's grace, He's given you a new heart, He's given you a new identity, and He's given you new longings, that you, my friend, are right now 100% dead to that thought, you know, it makes you more responsible, not less responsible. Now there's no excuse. I mean, think about it. If it's just you and you can't help it, if it's just who you are, well, you know, I'm only a sinner saved by grace. That's all, who I, that's all I am, a sinner saved by grace. So I can't help it. What do you expect from a sinner? Just sin. Do you see that without the grace of God, without the message of identity, we would have... A landmark excuse for more and more sin. I'm just being who I am, a dirty, rotten sinner. But with the grace of God and through the grace of God, because you've been made new at the core, now there's no excuse. It's not who you are. Why would you let a parasite dominate you When it's not who you are. I don't care if you've given in 500 times. Today, you are dead to sin and alive to God. How much? 100%. 10 out of 10. All the way, you're a slave of righteousness. So, do you see it? In every moment, there is a perfect reason 
for you to say no to sin. Somebody says, well, I've already done it 500 times. Why not do it once more? Here's why. What benefit are you deriving from the things of which you're now ashamed? The outcome of that is never good. Somebody says, well, I'm totally forgiven, so why not just do it one more time? Because you can be forgiven and miserable. That's why. And your heavenly Father has given you a new calling. This is all about you getting to be healthy and thinking in a new way and acting in a new way. This is for our good. He's not holding out on us. He's giving us His best. And that is not His best. And so the death that He died to sin, He died once for all in the same way Count yourselves dead to sin. Don't wait to be dead to sin. This philosophy of you need to die to self, it is false, it is a lie, and it it takes away the power of the gospel in the moment you believe that. If you believe that you need to wait to die to self, wait to die to sin, then here comes temptation knocking at your door, and who knows if you're ready to respond because How dead are you to sin, and how alive are you to God? Well, one day, well, after I read my Bible, well, after I go to church more, well, I'm a young Christian, well, I don't know that much about church. Do you see what the enemy is doing? Postponing your victory and postponing your choice so that you will settle for less in this life. And it's a lie. It's a deception. You, right now, are a slave of righteousness. You can't help it. You can't get away from it, my friend. You are a partaker of His divine nature. All right, well, let's talk about another temptation, a very different kind. It's the idea of holding resentment against other people. Now, this is pervasive. It's pervasive in our society because we believe we've got rights. And we come into this world hanging on tightly to our rights. And when someone infringes upon those rights, we are offended. We believe they deserve punishment. And so we hold resentment against them, don't we? And you say, well, they deserve it. I mean, look what they did to me. Yeah, but you're not doing yourself any favors. You're not benefiting yourself. You're not living the healthy life that God has as your destiny. If you choose to harbor the bitterness and resentment against them, it does you no good. Now, I'm not saying that you got to be best buds with them. I'm not saying that you just tear down all boundaries and forget the past and act like it never happened. That's some people's view of forgiveness. But did you know that forgiveness is not really forgetting? You know, when God forgave us, He wasn't an old man who misplaced His keys somewhere. You know, when you can't find your keys, well, God did not somehow misplace your sins, and He kind of scratches His head and has forgotten where they are. That's not what real forgiveness is. God could recall every single sin you've ever committed, but He chooses He chooses on purpose not to hold it against you. And so that's the type of forgiveness that is needed. Ephesians chapter 4 speaks to this. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Now, the irony, again, the irony in all of this is that we think we're going to be happy holding a grudge. We think that if we wait longer to forgive, that somehow that's going to work for us. Have you ever asked someone, well, have you forgiven them? And they say, well, I'm working on it. Or, I'm not ready yet. Or, it takes time. Do you know that that too is a lie? That it doesn't take time? That it's not something you work on. And in fact, it's even a lie that you're not ready yet. 
Here's why. When you were crucified with Christ, when you became dead to sin and alive to God, guess what? You became dead to bitterness and alive to forgiveness. You became a person that is not just forgiven, but you became a forgiving person. You, by nature, by heart, you are a forgiving person now. And so the deception, the temptation there is to buy the lie that this will work for me, that if I hold back, if I act as if this person owes me, if I act as if there is a debt between us, that somehow that's going to give me the edge. That's going to protect me. That's going to guard me. That's going to help me process my pain if I just hold a debt over them living in bitterness. Now, that's the deception. You know what the truth is? The truth is your heart craves the idea of releasing them from that debt. That's what you want. So when you make that appointment with God... Oh, it may be one minute, it may be ten seconds, it may be ten minutes. But when you make that appointment with God and you say, God, this person hurt me deeply because that's what they did. Oh, yeah, you're you're dealing with rage and anger and maybe even brawling, as Ephesians 4 says. And that looks so strong, especially among us men. The rage, the anger, the brawling, it looks so strong. But you know what it is? It's hurt. That's what it is. Beneath all of the things that appear strong, what we're really processing is pain. There is hurt underneath that anger. And so when you take the 10 seconds or the 10 minutes to say, Father, show me. Show me how I've been hurt. Show me the pain And then, Father, lead me through this. I want to release them. I want to do what you did for me. I want to cancel the debt. Even if they do this to me again, I forgive them because I'm a forgiving person in Christ. I believe this is right for me. I believe this is the choice for me. I believe this is the way forward. I cannot choose bitterness and resentment anymore. I release them. I cancel the debt. It's as if there's an IOU certificate right in front of you from this person and you tear it up and you say, they don't owe me anything. Now again, this doesn't mean you call them up and you say, look what a spiritual person I am. I forgave you, so let's go for pizza. (laughs) You know what? It may be healthy for some very sound reasons, For you to remain not in contact with them. Perhaps they're abusive. Perhaps it's an unhealthy dynamic between you. There may be loads of reasons for you to keep your distance. This is not about pretending that everything is fine. This is about releasing them from what they owe you. Even if they do it again. It's for your benefit. Maybe that's the lie. The lie is also that forgiveness is only for them. Well, you know what? They may never know about it. They may never realize it. They may never know the decision that you arrived at. They may never know or realize that you canceled their debt, but you did it because it's who you are. It's a description of your heart. It's what you want. You can't live the other way. You can't think the other way. It doesn't fit. You're new. You're different. You're alive. Count yourself as dead to bitterness. Count yourself Alive to forgiveness. It is your identity. All right, well, let's uh, talk about something related, and that is revenge. You ever struggle with this? I mean, to want to get back at someone, and maybe you've watched a film or two where there's a great deal of pain and even torture and punishment upon someone, and they have a chance They have a chance to get back at the other person. And just as they're thinking of doing it and they've got their plan in mind, they decide to release that person and forgive them and not take the revenge they could have. Well, you know, the New Testament talks about this attitude. It says in Romans 12, 
Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now, this doesn't mean that you go out of your way to be a doormat and apologize for your thoughts and say you're sorry for your feelings and uh, just absolutely be a milk toast. Do you notice the expression here in verse 18? As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. You cannot, you cannot control the choices of other people. You could choose to forgive and release. You could choose to hold no grudge. And yet, they remain in bitterness and resentment towards you. You can't control that. And yet, some of us go into codependency. You know this term, codependency? It's the idea that I can't feel good unless I'm sure that you feel good. And I feel good when you feel good. And when you feel bad, I feel bad. And so I am getting my life from you. Therefore, if you're offended and I seek to uh, be at peace with you, and then you inform me, no, no, it didn't work. No, no, you're still angry. Well, then I do whatever I can to get you to feel good so that I can feel good. And you know, the Bible never leads us there. The New Testament never takes us there. You know why? Because your permission to feel okay is not granted from another human being. Your permission to feel right, your permission to think right, your permission to feel okay is not really granted from your fellow human beings. It is granted by God. He is your righteousness. He is your justification. He is your forgiveness. He is your right standing. He is your position at the right hand of God. He is your life. He is your everything. And He has given you permission to feel okay about you. Do you know that? And this is not a feel-good message. No, this is a feel-great message. (laughs) You've been given permission to feel great. Now, I'm not saying that you're always going to feel great. I don't feel great many days. Many days I feel bad. But the point is, it's not God who is holding us back from feeling okay about ourselves. And so when we go codependent, we have gone beyond our responsibility, trying to be peacekeepers and giving ourselves permission to feel okay only when others feel okay. This happens in marriage. Two people under one roof. One person controls the other person, maybe without even fully realizing it. Both parties make a decision. One person makes a decision to manipulate. The other person makes a decision to respond to that and say, I will feel good when they feel good. And things grow unhealthy. But Paul's logic here in Romans 12 is to live at peace with others as far as it depends on you. And then he goes on with something that maybe makes us feel, I don't know, a little uncomfortable. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Now, over the years, we've sort of picked at the expression, let go, let God. You know, many use that as some sort of passive move. I'm going to let go, let God. I've got nothing to do with this situation. I've got to get out of the way. It's all Him, none of me. And for the most part, that's nonsense. You've been invited. You've been included. You're one with Christ. You're the new creation. Jesus isn't. You're the new creation. You're a child of God. He is your strength and He is your source, but you are fully a child of God and you belong in the midst of everything. It's all of Him and all of you together, except when it comes to revenge. Do you see it? Romans chapter 12 is essentially saying, Revenge, let go. Revenge, let God. It's His business. There will be a final day. Let that day be what it is. Don't put yourself in a role that you were never designed 
to bear. Don't take revenge, my dear friends. Leave room for God's wrath. It is mine to avenge, says the Lord. So, This really isn't about imagining all the punishment that someone will undergo. We don't understand the mercy of the Lord. We don't fully get what's going to happen on the day of judgment. We just know God is good, and I'm going to let God be God, and I'm not going to try to be God. It's too much for me to bear, so I am going to live in the health of that God has granted me, and the way forward is forgiving and canceling the debt and releasing that person from anything they owe me, and I'm going to be who I am, a forgiving child of God at heart. All right, well, what about pride? That's an interesting temptation, and I've often joked about pride, and people will come to me in a counseling setting sometimes, and they'll say, Andrew, I... I... I hate to tell you this, but I, I've got a serious problem with pride. And I like to kind of lean back in my chair and say, really? Why? And just let them talk. Because when you give somebody an opportunity to talk about their big struggle with pride, usually the reasons they are prideful don't exactly stack up to thousands of other humans who have accomplished more in life, who have achieved greater feats in life. I mean, just think about it. Army generals who have achieved amazing feats in military battle. Olympians, athletes who have achieved a gold, silver, or bronze medal with the world as their stage. The audience looking on from hundreds of countries around the world. And they win. The most intelligent people who have perfect IQs and unbelievable intellectual achievements. So whether it's the military general, whether it's the Olympic athlete, or whether it's the genius, could you remind me again why you struggle so much with pride? It's silly when you think about it, right? It's silly because we're seeking to build an identity around our little world and what we believe we've done in it. And the New Testament speaks to this, 1 John chapter 2. It says, everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The enemy would love for you to carve out a little identity so that you don't enjoy a big one. And see, that's the irony. People think that if they think too highly of themselves, if they think too much of themselves, that that's what pride is. Well, it's not the thinking highly. It's what is the high thinking based on. Because indeed, God has raised you up. Indeed, He has seated you at His right hand. You are high and lifted up. You are seated, you are in Christ, and Christ is in you. There are plenty of lofty reasons to take pride in who Jesus has made you. Do you see that? And so that is not arrogance. It is not arrogance to brag on Jesus. It is not arrogance to brag on the finished work of Christ. It is not arrogance to have confidence in what God has done for you and what God has done to you. But there is a pride and an arrogance that the world tempts us with. And you know what? It's beneath us. We're above it. It's beneath us. We're above it. But it comes to us and it says, make your identity, fashion your worth and value out of this little world that you've created. Perhaps your family line, your family name, uh, the size of your home, the, the expense of all your belongings, the, the wife or husband that you have, the family. Uh, let's take your little world and let's fashion an identity for you that you can then shop around town and compare with other people and see how you stack up. And this is largely how the world does it. We do it with neighborhoods. We do it uh, with job placement. You see uh, 
all kinds of discrimination over the decades here in the United States. You see uh, not only discrimination light, but you see racism, full-blown racism. People have carved out identities based on their lineage, their heritage, their neighborhood, their accomplishments, their wealth, or, or lack of. And those who are lesser get categorized and labeled, and those who are greater, or at least believe themselves to be, get categorized and labeled. And that comes, as John says in the second chapter, it comes not from the Father, but from the world. And so, there's nothing wrong with fashioning an identity as, wrong, as long as it is centered around Jesus Christ. And then there's loads of bragging to be done. There's loads of pride to be had. You can be proud of all that Jesus Christ accomplished for you and all that He did to you in transforming who you are and giving you something they can't take from you. No matter where you live, no matter what you drive, no matter what you earn, no matter what they say, no matter what you thought, no matter how they treated you, you have something unshakable and unbreakable. You have something they cannot take. Galatians chapter 6, it says, If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then look at this. I, I love this because it turns everything upside down. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. What? Then they can take pride in themselves alone. Paul, that is not, that's not religious sounding, Paul. You're supposed to tell us to take no pride in anything. He doesn't do it. He won't go there. He won't go to this martyr-like religious system of kill yourself and tear yourself down and Martin Luther out in the snow, beating himself with leather straps to punish himself, staying out all night, his friends dragging him into safety in the morning, and him calling it spiritual humility. You know what? The Apostle Paul won't have it. There is a joy we can have about who we are. And it's not arrogance. It's not lack of humility. True humility is saying the same thing that God says about you. No more and no less. Did you hear that? No less. Knowing your identity, counting on your identity, that is not arrogance. That's godly humility. Know who you are. Be yourself and have confidence. It's okay. You're allowed to feel okay about you. In fact, it's what your heavenly Father wants. Galatians 6 also says this, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. That's humility. Watch yourselves or you also may be tempted Carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Now, it's interesting. People have warped the law of Christ. They've turned it into the law of Moses or some hybrid. They say, see, you're still under law. No, this is carrying one another's burdens. It's loving other people. So when they are tempted and when they fail, you come into the situation, and your heart longs to love them and care for them and restore them and counsel them and comfort them. And at the same time, here's what you're saying. At any moment, that, that, that could be me. At any moment, I could suffer in the same way, giving in to the same temptation. I've been hit with that thought 500 times myself. So friend, I get it. I get where you are. But let me help you. And that is humility. All right, well, now let's talk about the love of money. And this one can be sensitive for people. I mean, here we are 2,000 years later, 
and we're living in North America, many of us, and it's a prosperous nation, the United States, Canada. Many of you who are watching right now, you have to have a mobile device, so you own one. You have to have a, perhaps a computer, you own one. Uh, and so you're doing quite well compared with many around the planet at this moment. So the idea of money can be very sensitive. But you'll notice that I didn't say, nor does the Bible say, that money is the temptation. It is the love of money that is the temptation. And Hebrews chapter 13 does a great job addressing this. It says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Now notice... The author of Hebrews, he's not beating you over the head, making you feel guilty. I can't believe you like your paycheck. I can't believe you bought that television. I can't believe, and you fill in the blank there, because we're guilted by one group. We're told to aspire to the love of money by another group. I mean, think about it. The prosperity gospel says you need more money. The social gospel says you need less money, then you're more spiritual. So one gospel says more money, one gospel says less money, and the true gospel says either way, either way, you got to know, never will I leave you, I'll never forsake you. Do you see the sensitive heart of God in this? He's saying, I know why you're tempted to love money so much, it's because you're scared. You're scared of not having security, but I'm your security. Do you see his heart? Do you see his attitude? He's not giving us a thrashing over this. This is the comforter talking straight at you. This is the counselor reasoning with you. Look, keep your lives free from that snare. Don't be addicted. You got to know I'm with you no matter what. All right, well, lastly, I want to talk about past abuse. You say, well, what does that have to do with temptation? Well, we're tempted to view ourselves as being victims and to only view ourselves as being the sum total of what's happened to us. And some of us have experienced physical abuse. Some of us have experienced sexual abuse. Some of us have experienced verbal abuse, emotional abuse. You've been told you're no good. You've been told you're worth less than him. You're worth less than her. And eventually you believe you're worthless. And so we take on these categories and labels and we begin to dismiss our own value. And the enemy loves to have a heyday with this, tempting us to believe that we're the sum total of our past. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, God chose the lowly things of this world. He chose the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before Him. The passage continues, it says, It is because of Him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, our holiness, our redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who brags... Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. You say, what does this have to do with people who've been abused? Well, I hope you see it. You know, righteousness is not a word that's reserved for Sunday morning. What they told you and what they did to you communicated that you're not right, that you're not good enough, that you don't have value that you're worth abusing, that they can use you because you're worth nothing. They're lofty and important, and you're a nobody. Therefore, you submit to my words and my deeds and allow me to abuse you. And that's what they communicated to you. They told you that you were lowly, and maybe you were in their eyes. But do you see what 1 Corinthians 1 is saying? Oh, my goodness. You, my friend, are not lowly. You are now lofty. You 
are not an abuse victim. You're a child of God, holy, righteous, and blameless. Oh, you've been abused, and you were a victim, but that's not your identity. Your identity is not guilt or shame or confusion or the labels and categories they put on you. The God of the universe has spoken. He says, you're blameless, you're spotless, you're without blemish, you're right, you're bought. He paid for you. He longed to own you. Jesus says, thank you, Father, for those whom you have given me. You're a gift from God the Father to Jesus. The entire Trinity is pleased to have you. You're never alone. You're infinitely valued. You have infinite worth beyond measure. Scale of 1 to 10, you're an 11. You're off the charts. You're blameless, holy, righteous, perfect. No, you don't act perfect. He sees your heart. You have a perfect heart. You are the perfect you. All right, well, what did we see today? We saw two passages at the beginning. The first, 1 Corinthians 10, it says, God always gives you a way out. And you say, all right, God, there's a way out. You promised it. 1 Corinthians 10, I read it, I see it, I believe it. There's a way out. But what is it? Do you remember the way out? Here it is. In the same way that Jesus is dead to sin, count yourselves dead to sin and alive to God. Somebody says, you're worthless. You say, I'm dead to that thought. I am infinitely valued by the God of the universe. Somebody says, you're lustful. You say, I'm dead to that. I'm a slave of righteousness. My heart is filled with purity. I want nothing to do with lust. It is not who I am. Somebody says, you're resentful and bitter. You say, hey, I may have acted that way, but let me tell you, I figured out who I am. I'm dead to bitterness. I'm dead to resentment. I'm alive to forgiveness. I have a forgiving heart. God made me that way, and I believe my dad. Do you see it? It's a beautiful thing. You are now dead to sin and alive to God, permanently fused, connected, bonded with Jesus. He's changed who you are. He's transformed what you want. Something new at the core of your being has happened, and it makes all the difference when temptation hits. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the truth that sets us free. We thank you that there is not a single truth more practical than this. We died with you. We resurrected with you. We're fully forgiven. We're made new at the core. We're addicted to Jesus. We want what you want. Temptation knocks and we can say I'm dead to that. And we can mean it and it's real And we thank you for the truth that we are not defined by past abuse, that we are not defined by past failure. We are defined by your incredible success on the cross through the resurrection. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen.